Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the second annual Faces for Autism Streaming with Love Telephone. I'm Jacob Hackett. I'm happy to be back with all of you this year. Uh, just like last year, for those of you that watched us last year or you're new to the program, uh, you can donate down the bottom of the screen. Uh, Faces for Autism, you can donate on our website, facesforautism.org. There's a donate button up at the top. Uh, please donate on Venmo. Please donate at the number down the bottom, as I said, or any of our social media channels. Uh, my first guest this evening, she is a speech language pathologist major at Boston University in the graduate studies program. Uh, she went to Temple, Temple University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. For any of you watching us up there, um, in her free time, she sings uh, down, down at the Jersey Shore. For any of, any of you watching us down uh, in Southern New Jersey, please welcome um, Megan Flatley. Hi, everybody. I'm Megan. Um, as Jacob said, I am a speech language pathology major. I started my program at Temple and I did my four years of undergrad there. And then I moved up to Boston this year and I started my graduate program at Northeastern, um, which is a two year program. And then when that's complete, I will start my clinical fellowship and become an SLP. So thanks for having me, Jacob. I'm excited to be here. Thank, thank you for being here as my my first interview uh, tonight. Uh, Megan, my first question for the for those of the, the viewers watching us worldwide tonight, give people a sense of like what what was it that made you say I want to be an SLP. Yeah, so I really, I knew I wanted to work in school and SLPs do so much more than work in a school. There's SLPs in hospitals, there's um, private practices, early intervention. Um, so many SLPs work in uh, universities, do research, um, professors, clinics, the whole nine yards. But I knew I wanted to work in a school. Ever since I was younger, my mom's a teacher. I, I just knew that that was what I wanted to do. And as I got closer to my senior year of high school, I realized like maybe teaching isn't the, the exact path for me. Maybe I can explore some other options and see ways that I can work in a school and still be in that environment, be with children, mm -hmm. potentially have the um, schedule of having summers off. And like that sounded like a, like a nice deal for me. So I started looking into some specialty programs in schools. And so I had to do an independent study when I was a senior um, at, Sacred Heart, or at Sacred Heart Academy. And we did one week in any profession that you wanted to like do a one week internship type thing with. And so I reached out to an occupational therapist, a speech therapist and a special ed teacher. And the occupational therapist wasn't able to like accommodate all the days because she only worked three days a week. So that wasn't gonna work. And the special education teacher um, just hadn't get back, gotten back to me in the time that the SLP did. So I was like, okay, this sounds great. The SLP got back to me. She can accommodate all five days. So let's check that out. And so I was there for five days. And then I did um, a report and a presentation to my school about it. But in those five days, I just, I learned so much. I fell in love with the field. I really didn't know what I was getting myself into because my only motivation in that, in this, some type of sense was, oh, this is a job in a school that's a little bit more specialized, has a little bit more flexibility. Let's try that out. And so I went to the school for those five days and like day one, I just was like, oh my God, this is so cool. And I fell in love. And so I started applying to schools. I, start, I changed a lot of my like application majors from psychology and education to speech. And that was just kind of the start of it. There was no real scenario that pushed me in that direction. Um, my brother had early intervention when I was younger, so people would come into the house and work with him, but I didn't really know what was going on. So there wasn't really like 
any motivation like in my life that was like, oh, speech is what I want to do because of this. Uh, yeah, I, I just yeah, kind of fell into it, but it's been the best thing that I've ever felt it fell into. It was just incredible. So, yeah. <clears throat> speech does not. Yes, the school is a big part of it. But just as you said, speech is comes on so many different levels. You could have gone into a rehab facility. You could have gone into essentially any form of rehab, any form of where someone needs your help or assistance of others. Yeah, and it's incredible because it's not even just um, like medically or at, like academically that people need help. Um, there's a whole like subgroup of speech therapists that work on voice and um, voice altercation. So people who are transgender and transitioning who want to adjust their voice to be a higher pitch or a lower pitch, they would go see a speech therapist who could help them with that. Or actors who have a British accent and they have to play a role of somebody who speaks in an American accent they might go to a speech therapist to help them adjust their accent for the role that they might be playing. So the realms are endless, like in, in any type of communication, modification, anything along those lines, it's not just a medical or academic setting where speech therapists are helpful. It, it falls into so many other realms. Yeah, and, I, and just as you were saying about being the actors, point of view, I would have never even thought of that. Like, okay, you have, like, a, and that happens to a lot of actors when you make the transition from British to America and vice versa. I, I would have never even thought you would go to a speech therapist uh, or something like that. But, but I mean, it makes sense now. For those of viewers watching tonight, give, comparing um, Temple to Boston, are there different things you've learned, different strategies? Like, did you, when you were at Temple, did you go to like any hospital settings? Like say, if you went to a hospital setting to a school, school setting is what I mean. Yeah, so in undergrad, you don't do too much um, like hands-on with patients and clients and students. Um, you do some observations, but past that, there's not much like direct contact, contact with the people that you're helping. You're kind of just learning the basics. So when I was at Temple, it was a lot of just being in class and learning in the environment of a classroom but from the experience of my professors. Whereas when I came up here, they kind of threw us right in the deep end. Like here you have clients on week one, you're gonna like work with these children or adults or whoever you might be around. And um, like, it was like right away we worked with people. But the most interesting thing that my, that didn't transfer from Philadelphia when I was at Temple was I came up here and my first client was this four year old boy and he could not say his R's. Every word that he said, his R was just missing. Wada, like pop, like all of his R's were missing. And I get out of our diagnostic and I'm like, I know what's wrong with this kid. I know what his issue is. He can't say his R's. And my supervisor looks me down in the face and she goes, Megan, what city are we in? And I was like, oh, we're in Boston. Nobody says they're R's. So it was just a funny like experience how dialects can affect what kids hear and what they say. Most children learn to speak by mimicking and hearing what other people say. So if your parent says, pak ka and the havid yad, you're not gonna say your R's. You don't hear your R's because your parent isn't saying them. So it was really interesting to be in a new city where I say my R's, I say other words weird, like water and like different things like that. But um, I call like subs hoagies and things like that. So the dialect is, it's just a very interesting thing. I come here, I say my R's. So I hear this kid talking and I'm like, oh, the problem is clear as day. He doesn't say his R's. And it was just such a like 
revelation moment to hear like, well, you're in Boston, that's not a surprise. So yeah, it's, it's an interesting, it's interesting learning in two different cities. Um, and it really gave me perspective on how if I end up in another city, there might be another dialectal situation that I have to kind of tackle prior to seeing clients. And that's a big one. I mean, if, especially if you live, if, you know, if you continue to live there past your undergrad, I mean, past your, past your, um, past uh, graduate school, mm -hmm. you're going to have to teach people. And this sounds funny for us East Coasters down here, how to pronounce their R's because we do not say water. We do not say, what are, what are, I'm trying to think, what are some of the other words? Um, There's so many. I get made fun of a lot for how I say grass. People say they say grass and I say grass, like my A's are a little harsher. Um, like there's a lot of words like that. It's funny. It's it's really funny. There's like so many of them that just change from where you are. And even like things, um, it's a very like Northeast thing to call like a remote control for your TV, a clicker. So somebody might say a clicker and they're like, what are you talking about? Or like um, in the Midwest, they call shopping carts buggies or like some people call soda pop. Like there's, there's definitely little things that aren't even necessarily dialect, but vocabulary. Yeah, it's like, it's, like hearing things like that, it's like like the way people used to talk, like like way way back, well, like 30, 40, upwards of yeah. 50 years ago. So people are bringing bringing back um, like the slang terms because stuff just hasn't uh, let go. Yeah. Never will let go either. Um, I remember when I was following your journey online about how you decided where to go when you visited, say, Boston, because you also went to, correct me if I'm wrong, Chicago. Where else? Did so, yeah, you I looked at schools in Chicago. I never went and visited, but I did, I looked at schools there. What was it? Like, what was the difference between where you visited after Temple that made you say, oh, I see myself there? Yeah, so I looked at schools and I applied all over the place. I applied to schools in Chicago. I applied to schools in Washington, D.C. I applied to schools up in Boston, um, in New York City. Um, I applied to a school in Oregon. I applied to school in Arizona. I applied to a school in Hawaii. Like I was applying all over the place. I was like, I'm just going to let all my decisions go out there. And once they come back, like I'll put all my applications out. Once the decisions come back, then I can really take a, a good look and decide which one is the best fit for me. And I felt like as acceptances were coming in, Northeastern showed the most like interest in me. Um, they had a student reach out to me separately and just like, say like, hey, if you want to have a like call, we can talk, I can give you any input. Um, so that was really like comforting knowing that like they really cared about me and like wanted to know me and wanted me to get to know them before I really made that decision. And so um, when I came up and visited here, I looked at a couple apartments, I checked out the area, and I do, my aunt lives over in Cambridge, which isn't very far from where I live in Back Bay, Boston. Um, and it was really nice to know that I had family close by, which I would have also had in DC, but in places like Chicago and Arizona and Oregon, I wouldn't have had family nearby. And that was like a little bit nerve wracking for me. And Boston was just a city, like I, I always felt a connection to. I applied here for undergrad. I applied Northeastern was my first pick for undergrad and it just ended up being a really expensive option compared to Temple. And I'm glad that I kind of found it again in my grad program because grad school is only two years and you pay by the credit. So it's a lot cheaper um, than if I went for the four years of undergrad. So a lot of things like just kind of like fell into place for me. Um, 
but I just think Boston's a really cool city and there's a lot of opportunities here. It's a huge college city. There's a ton of hospitals. Um, there's so many schools. Cambridge is a sanctuary city. So we, I'm working at a school in Cambridge right now and I'm seeing a lot of different dialects, a lot of students who speak multiple languages, um, a lot of different ethnicities coming in who have different accents because of where they moved from or where their parents moved from. So there's just a lot, a lot of diversity here. And I feel like that was really um, attractive to me because I felt like I could get a really well-rounded concept of what my speech journey might look like anywhere. So that was really what stuck out to me about Boston. Yeah, I mean, the family's there, but you want it. I mean, to me, I would think visiting somewhere diverse, that would be, you know, somewhere with more diversity because although Philly, Philadelphia is diverse, is it as diverse as Boston? Judging by what you're telling me right now, never even been there, the answer's no. Yeah, and the thing about Philadelphia is it's a very diverse city, but I've been there my whole life. And so I know what Philly has to offer. I've experienced what Philly has. So I felt like having a two-year period that had an end date to be like living in another city and experiencing something new, two years isn't long in the grand scheme of things. So it was a very like easy choice for me to make because I could say like, it's going to be over in two years. So if it's absolutely horrible and I hate Boston and I never want to come back here, two years ends and I'm done here. So that was a really like comforting feeling too, knowing that like, if I hated it, which I don't, I'm loving it. But if I did hate it, there was that, that back out option in two years. I didn't have to be here forever. Right. And then, um, and that'll make you feel good in, in the end. But like you said, you, you loved it. Um, and the dive and the diversity is key too. Um, yeah. Definitely. Um, friends, um, if, oh, I know what I wanted to ask you before I, I remind people to donate. If you were to give any up and coming speech majors any advice coming from the regular college life to graduate life, to anything in between, what would you say to them? Honestly, I'd love to have some like really huge advice for like how to be successful and like how to really like find the place that you want to find. But honestly, my number one thing is make sure that you're giving yourself time to have fun. You're in these really, really, really crucial years of your life that are building your character and you don't want to look back and say like, oh, I spent six years of my life sitting in a library with my head in my laptop make sure that like, obviously you're, you're putting the right amount of time into your academics because it is a very vigorous major. You need to be on top of everything you're, that you're doing. It's very time consuming. It's exhausting. If I told you I got eight hours of sleep every night, I'd be lying. It is an exhausting major. Make sure that you make time to have fun. Make sure that you set things on your calendar to spend time with your friends, to go to a farmer's market, to buy pretty flowers, to put into your apartment. Like make time for the little things because when you look back you're you're you don't want to only remember like being in a library and studying for school make sure that you balance the things in your life and you spend enough time on your application studying for your GRE all the little things yeah they're important they are and you need them to like get into the grad school and and be prepared for the grad school aspect of things but like definitely make time for yourself, for your mental health and your self-care and your friendships and relationships. It's really important to have that balance because you can't be successful if you're not enjoying your life and you need to enjoy your life to be successful. It's a, it's a full circle. So that's my biggest advice, I think. Yeah, and just as you said, basically, Megan, life... Life comes full circle, and if, you, and if you're not going to take the time to enjoy to enjoy the six years of your life, then life is those six years. Are they going to be enjoyable? No, no. it's going to be a chaotic time in your life, 
with so much stress that's only what you know exactly so and it's going to be stressful there's no way around it it's a good it's a stress it is a stressful time it's going to be stressful but making sure that you put things in place and, and like look at your syllabus say like okay i have a test on march 8th i'm gonna plan something for march 10th because i won't have to study right away i can maybe go to a concert or go to a basketball game or i don't know like just go out to dinner with your friends and try a new restaurant there's always there's always an hour in your week that you can fit in something fun you can find an hour to just do something that you're going to enjoy, especially if you're in a new city or a new town and like there's stuff to explore. Because I feel like my biggest thing when I moved here in the beginning was I'm living in this brand new city and I want to experience it, but I don't have time. And so finding the time to really see the things that are in the new place that you're living, if you are going to a new place or just experiencing the thing, like your favorite things in the place that you've always lived in, whatever it might be, it's just really important to have that time in your schedule. Right. Uh, uh, friends, just a reminder, uh, I mentioned it in the beginning before the interview, uh, please donate. Uh, Faces needs every dollar you can give. Uh, these organizations have had a rough couple of years. Uh, Megan can tell you, I can tell you, having gone through education during a pandemic, let alone college, it's not easy. Uh, please donate. These organizations are trying to get back on their feet to not help me, but to help you. They need your help. Please donate down the bottom of the screen. Please donate online. I will say it many, many times tonight. We still have five hours and change to go. Please donate. 